we have Laura Phelps Rogers. Um, <laughs> so she's currently residing in Denver, Colorado, where she got her BFA in 2013, right? Yeah. yeah. From the University of Denver, Colorado. Uh, so she's an installation artist and working with fabrication and casting and creating multi-material installations. And her work is influenced by her collective experience and suggests a hint of nostalgia by integrating personal memories, family memories, and social and cultural memories into visual narratives. Uh, so Laura Phelps Rogers does performance photography along with um, receiving cast metal and has received local and national attention for her work. Um, she has sculpture in the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, Auschwitz Campus Foyer in the Fugalinti Pavilion, and was recently awarded a public art project for Metro West Housing in Colorado. Um, recent solo, let's see, uh, oh, she's a member of Pirate and Ice Cream Gallery in Colorado, and recent solo ex exhibitions include A Woman's Work Is Never Done, Entertain, 100, or 1,100 Pieces, and A Space and Time. And in 2013, her work was included in 20 juried and invitational exhibitions, including in San Francisco. I just go to sleep, just thinking about my free time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chicago, Scottsdale, and Cheyenne. So, Thank yeah, you, Laura. Like, so, <laughs> so, anyway, the thought about talking is really wanting to expand my research into the area of narrative identity, which is really linked to a psychological principle. And I think I took my, you know, taking my work a step further and not only looking at why I'm making art from an academic point of view um, in terms of theory. But you know, asking that question one more time beyond that theoretical point of view of really why am I making art? So um, I think it sort of unfolded slowly for me, and I would like to create sort of a professional dialogue. And it's helpful to have people that you're already sort of communicating with, Stacy, Stacy, and now you, and 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 you as well, and because uh, essentially, I feel like iron. You know, did open the door to my subconscious, and you know, by do by by believing that, believing that iron opened the door to my subconscious, it made me question why, why further. So um, I think it is directly connected to using bound materials and and connecting the labor intensity of the process to the fact that my physical energy was attaching to the work, and so. Um, you know, I mean, it's something that I really feel like I want to dialogue about with other people. I, I can't move forward with the research if people don't talk to me uh, more about why they're making art, or I can talk about, we're, Kelly and I were just talking, in essence, why she has sort of biomorphic things hanging off of her found objects. And, it, you know, I sort of suspect now from talking to her, it's because she's sort of trying to, pay, to trace her past and that it's like trying to get through it in the cobweb. So it's those deeper, I think, psychological thoughts that are what's driving my research. And um, I'd like to sort of create a movement, you know, in terms of just like their surrealism of getting academics to think one step further and go into that narrative spot. So I know what slide we're all on. That we, that we all have stories, and that uh, where that exposure to casting is is um, attached through 30 years of being an antique dealer, and sort of having people's memories and thoughts. And so everything I cast was sort of through the process of substitution, and um, how I began realizing that substitution was a way to connect with people through familiarity. And your husband talked about it earlier in his talk. Um, I was really surprised by thinking about iconography and how that same process attaches from a religious point of view from the antithesis of a complete unreligious point of view from a pop art perspective. So I was sort of surprised um, just even today to be able to include that, how how my work truly is memory based, and through those memories, uh, that uh, it you know maintains some significance to my life and sort of culture. So, um, 
So the theory of narrative identity postulates that individuals form identity by uh, identities by integrating their life experience um, and uh, internalizing it into this ever-evolving story of yourself. So um, narr the narrative process, you know, allows you sort of that opportunity to take a step further and to to um, to externalize what was internalized individually, um, giving your life both a sense and a purpose. And I think that as people, everything is moving so fast that that gives us sort of the ability to generate meaning to our life in terms of a culture or a community and, um, and then externalize our experiences from a generative point of view. And so that word generativity that's sort of key to the psychological principle behind narrative identity, that, that it's important for people to tell their story at some point in their life, and that that telling of the story is what makes their life significant. I mean, without it, we're not really people. We're just sort of moving through life without any sort of definition. And once you get to a point where telling your story is available to you as a process, whether it's through iron or any other means, then it gives you sort of some significance as a person. And it also allows you an opportunity to reconstruct the past, your perceived present, and your imagined future. So, um, looking further, I think, um, I don't know, you're in a deeper look. I think I'm at Bamberger, probably, I'm probably you're moving to. Uh, well you, could, you could go back, I guess. There's three. I'll talk about those slides. Go back three slides, and I guess so. Um, so for me, that was the thing. Uh, what caused me to take a deeper look is sort of that determination and a drive to tell this, to, to, to tell a story. And I think that it surfaced primarily because I didn't have children and. Um, that I, I couldn't tell my story through my children. I couldn't take all of my life experiences and say, here, here you go, don't do this, because if you don't do that, you'll succeed. So, you know, I had this sort of repressed desire to tell a story, and then I was talking to Kelly about it. The, the other thing is um, to be so integrated with three generations, I sort of suspect you were connected to your grandparents, where you, when you live on a farm or you're around people that came from farms that you, in my life, I'm able to witness through my grandparents everything pre-industrial age all the way up to where we are now. And it's, it's complex. I think trying to build both a personal timeline and a social timeline and feeling this sort of obligation that I have a duty to reconstruct some of those things that have happened through a contemporary modern approach uh, of, of, of who we are socially and culturally. So um, I, think, um, I think with that said, then it caused me really to think about, you know, how, how do you make meaning out of your life? And it goes beyond just yourself and telling your story and your relative story. You know, it goes to a bigger place. I mean, where, 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 does, where do those people's meanings fit in, in from a larger and a social con construct? So um, I think that's driven my work to become bigger and bigger. So I've gone from you know, this size to this size to this size. So um, I think that as, as my story broadened, so did the size of my work as well. That it became more and more difficult to put it in the little tiny box. So. And then actually this particular, this slide is a quote from this uh, leading theorist on narrative identity who is not a part of the art world, world but has uh, dedicated 20 years to this principle of narrative identity. And in that 20 years of research, I reached out to him and he hasn't made a connection to people telling a story through their studio practice. And I was sort of in awe. I mean, you know, I reached out to him two or three times and I said, well, you know, it seems to me like uh, I'm doing all of the things that you're saying and I'm not doing it with words. So I'm doing it from a visual point of view. So that was where I got the idea to expand the research and 
try and start talking to people and maybe take um, that narrative, the, the critical theorist point of view of the narrative process from a visual point just a step further, ask that question one more time. So with that said, it's a very difficult subject to talk about because no one really wants to talk about their deep dark secrets. And they don't, you don't want to tell it to me. And people sort of fear talking about it. So I think for me to expand my research and keep that dialogue going, I have to bring it sort of to a business point of view. So here I bring Bamberger into the picture. And so he's written some articles on uh, you know, business coaching, you know, you, you as an artist, that, that you can get to a point of theory of you know, your, your instructors or involved if you've been making art for 20 or 30 years, you know, well, why do you make art? Okay, you know, well, I make art because we were talking about it earlier, Ellen. I, I like the color blue, or I'm making it because I feel a connection to that found object. But the fact of the matter is, if you can go to that next place psychologically in your head, um, that deep, dark place that people don't want to talk about, uh, then you know, you're doing yourself a favor because it does make it easier to sell your work. And whether it's monetarily selling or getting yourself into galleries, it gives you, creates that dialogue where you have the ability to talk about it, not stop like I'm doing right now, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I think uh, it is. It, I think it, it is helpful, sort of, to bring it to, to bring it a little bit further in terms of uh, from a business point of view, of you know who's telling the story and why are you telling the story and how it can improve your bottom line. So, um, let's see, somewhere am I at here? I'm trying to lose my space a little bit. What's the next slide here? Yeah, so business and academics meet, you know, they implement the storytelling, storytelling process defined in the narrative process and then um, use that ideolo ideology to, you know, to actually sell, to, to tell, sell your work. So, you know, I mean, what, what, like, what do you guys think about it? I mean, I, I'd like to sort of create a dialogue about it so I understand uh, where other artists are in terms of their storytelling process. What do you think, Stacey? Um, I don't, I do, I think, I consider my work like a personal narrative. Um, and the things that I struggle with, though, are making it, um, I guess, apparent to the viewer, the story that is within the work. Um, and so I'm having difficulty, you know, bridging the two together. Like, here's the story and here's the work, but the viewer is missing it. Well, we were talking about it earlier, and I think, I think probably one of the things that sort of uh, comes of this, this little bit of academic research in this field is that it's actually sort of irrelevant. It's irrelevant because what, what happens through you telling your story is that actually other people's stories become evident. So your energy is now sort of attached to whatever story that it, it has. And you can, you know, at the beginning of your show or on the postcard or like she introduced me, you're always going to have a paragraph. So there's your story. Right. But when... I'm telling that to your thesis committee. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> well, I mean, but I think it's sort of the same as what we're talking about now because you have an opportunity to talk to other people um, you know, in your department right. before it actually comes down to putting the thesis on writing. So, you know, the, the reality is, is you, you created the work to create an experience for someone else because that's why you put it out in the world. If it was really, truly only your story, then you would just keep it in a room and not let anybody see it. Right. So it isn't your story. It's your story that leads to someone else's story. And so... What I realized is when you create an installation that's a, in a room this big, nobody is going to freaking buy a piece of art that's 30 by 30, you know, maybe a museum. So, so okay, but so what did, why did I do that? Why did I go through all that? Well, what happens is after you've created it, there's this moment when people, they start giving you feedback. And so that feedback that you get, that they give you, that's why you did it. 
And for that moment, you hold that little part of that person in your hand, and so that's where the power is. That's where the power as an artist is. And it's, it's, it's almost better than money, I think. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, Carl doesn't believe that because we're going broke. <laughs> make, me making art, but <laughs> so, so. She's going broke, I'm holding the fingers in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think you know, you know, and I started realizing really how you know how layered my work was, and that's you know what sort of facilitated taking the research and stuff further into you know what I'd like to call narrative identitivism. Because the thing is, is I realized that I was beginning to layer my memories of all these people, you know, grandparents, social memories, cultural memories. And it wasn't just one thing. It just it, it, it just really wasn't quite that simple. And then there were even larger contrasts between, you know, the ordinary or the mundane or my father's Protestantism and my mother's Catholicism. And all of these different topics became layered into one work. Well, people be, began to respond to it in a, in a multi-dimensional ways. You know, some people would see the relevance of religion. People would see the mundane versus the intricate, you know, and, and it was interesting to see how people would enter my work from all these different places by basing it on memory. So, what 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 well, I was just going to say, my experience was way long ago in grad school, but it does seem like it's a, two different realities. Like where you're at now, you they kind of expect you to learn how to talk about it and explain your choices, right. your materials, the you know maybe more. Um, uh, just you know, components of the work so that you're able to talk about it and, and I guess that really clarifies in your own mind just like you were saying just talking today you know it can solidify your um, intent and your um, perception of it and then you learn to talk about it but then once you're done with grad school as Laura said it's out there and it's really for others to um, experience and then to come to their own Reality. It I mean, solidifies like it, your work, yeah. like Ellen is saying, it opens a door for everybody else. Yeah. But it's grad school is the time where you really, right. you know, because you, you have to really clarify for yourself what you're doing and then to be able to talk about it. But once it's out, um, you know, I think an artist statement is nice. Like, I always look for those because it gives me insight. But like you were saying, someone else, you know, a viewer's experience might not be what yours is, but it doesn't have to be if they're getting to a place. <coughs> I don't think it's important once you start realizing that that feedback that you get is sort of a form of currency. I mean, you know, because as we all know, it's not always that easy to sell your art unless, uh, you know, you're making something that's, you know, just, you know, kind of repetitive in some respects and just happen to get in this groove of something that sells. So, you know, what, what do you get back as an artist? And it's, so it's really, really true. In this memory-based work, the, the message that people give back to you is it, it, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. It just freaks me out. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some slides that um, this one particular work here. I was telling Kelly, you know, I'm, I'm sort of over this work. I've shown it a lot. Um, it's won a bunch of awards. But I mean, now that I'm less attached to it, there's a lot of my emotion physically invested in that as well as some blood, sweat, and tears. I think I got a hernia over it. And so there's a lot, there's, a, there's, I think, a lot of myself attached to that work, similar to that process and the iconic that your husband was talking about. And so therefore, that's what, where the power is. And that's kind of why I wanted to do this talk at the iron casting, because it is the labor intensity of the process that made me realize that my energy and my memories were literally attaching to the work. You know, because I touched it and handled it and mm -hmm. lost blood over it, and um, I don't really think I could have gotten to this level of research with um, the memory had it not been for casting. I mean, and I, it is directly linked to that labor intensity. But now I'm sort of over that piece because I've moved on to other work, but at the same time, I've had people cry over that piece. And I did, you know, and I think it was early on in my casting career, and so it really caused me to question, you know, why, and it's what's driven it further and further. And I think Kelly's kind of at that point as well, trying to figure out why it is she's, uh, you know, why certain objects are important, not from an academic uh, point of view of, of having to narrate why, but, you know, really questioning 
why? Why is one thing more important than another? And where is that coming from deep in your psyche? So, so uh, what, 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 do you have some thoughts? It's difficult for me to comment because I'm, I'm not a visual artist. But um, what I was thinking of earlier was the, the, the phrase or the, the dictum that's always said about poetry, which is, no ideas but in things. You can only communicate something that's important and, and emotionally resonant for someone else through a concrete image. And, um, and so my question for your thesis committee would be, how else are you going to do it? Right. You know, it has to be through this form, because it's the form that carries whatever your message is, whatever your memory is. Well, and I think so. What I what I figured out was sort of key through it. You know, key to the process in terms of expanding as an artist is to create this um, sense of familiarity, which I think as well is is similar to what uh, Jim was talking about, um, where you have this process of identification. And so, in our culture that identification comes through familiarity, and most of it's coming through iconography in terms of you know, colloquialisms or advertisements or big companies like Coca-Cola or DuPont or something, however you sort of remember things. And it's uh, though your reinterpretations of those familiarities which allows viewers to enter your work. Um, and I think that's a difficult place to get to. I mean, it's probably getting to that place is probably the most meaningful thing in terms of advancing my work. Um, so, do you have some input as well? Uh, I'm probably an outsider in this whole conversation because I don't actually do uh, iron work at all. Well, as a visual artist, what, uh, what, uh, do you have some input for us? What what uh what do you want me to address? Well, anything that you're comfortable about talking about, sort of in where where we're at in the conversation. Uh, it might be better to skip me and come back. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's it. That's the those are the next ones I think. And then what I do is I compare it to. Um, you know, I think sort of how it evolved, you know, referencing other people's work, which, you know, was important. Right. How's it going? Oh, yeah. okay. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. So, um, I think the most important thing probably was um, dealing with site specificity. I think that it probably helped me grow more than anything else as an artist. And so this was this work happened while I was in Ireland. And I had been casting, I think, for about a year and using some other mediums. But I went with I went to Ireland um, with the idea that I was going to do nothing but ephemeral work. That I wasn't going to use really any metal. I wasn't just going to use the things that were there. And I use sort of that approach a little bit like uh, Anne Hamilton, and I, I use her as a comparison slide in just a minute after this, of trying to bring sort of the place and the culture to the work. So these are potatoes um, that are strong, and then dirt to represent sort of the soil and that importance of what that, the role it played in Ireland. And then just to start to think about grasses, um, sculptural things, and so, um, um, you remember yeah. what the potatoes were? What, what do you mean? The uh, runes. Oh yeah. Oh, you mean so? Well, the, the, it, they also reference this uh, the very one of the earliest languages um, known to man, which is called the Ogums, and so they're they're kind of codex in how that language works. Is like there'd be two lines and three lines and four lines, and the number of lines represented uh, letters in the alphabet. So, and then everything is rusted there, of course, which that table is uh, rusted because of the humidity. Um, and so I just referenced Anne Hamilton's work in terms of, I think, how I got to that point. So the work on the left, of course, is indigo, which referenced the cotton farming and the importance of the cotton in making Levi's in that particular place where she did that uh, installation museum. And then um, the accountings, which was uh, an interesting work that addressed, it was in 
I think in New York, but it referenced uh, miners and um, how ca canaries were, were um, sent into the mine and sacrificed to make sure the air quality was good for miners. And then these are all cast wax heads. And I think the canaries were flying around in there. And then uh, this, the walls actually are treated in a way to reference that experience as well. So I think. Uh, and then this is some of my smaller installation work before my work got larger. And, you know, I began to realize that, that a lot of what I did was semi-autobiographical, if not 100% autobiographical. And so, uh, and how my memories to the things that I've been exposed to and the multi-generational aspects were driving the creation of my work. And, this work unquestionably references the fact that I'm battling with the idea of getting old, which I'm not happy with at all. Mm -hmm. And um, the melons are cast iron, and I just had a compulsion to create them. I had a compulsion to put them on an ironing board. Uh, I love uh, the idea of creating speaking liquids, and I think that definitely references aging. Um, Fanny Taz, uh, same thing, sort of referencing that entropy as the roses are dying in, in, the, in the exhibition. And that reference to women's work with apron, which a good portion of my work has referenced. Um, and Iron Maidens, I'm at a point now where I'm trying to create a hundred of those Iron Maidens, but that particular installation, um, they just sat on a table with those ribbons sort of referencing women as shoppers historically, that that's a task that's been assigned to us. For many hundreds of years, and um, sort of using these two reference points to sort of show that how I think I brought sort of women's roles and, and that feminist aesthetic to my work, um, both in uh, Merle Latterman um, getting down on her hands and knees and scrubbing the floor and doing this menial work in a public place. And of course, uh, Martha Rosler in the semantics of the kitchen, uh, I think very meaningful in terms of driving my work uh, from that point of view. And then um, Kelly mentioned that I have a piece in the Anschutz Med campus, and so uh, this is it, and it, that is it installed. And it, it was actually a part of the show called The Women's Work Is Never Done. And, um, in that show, it referenced women's role in terms of genealogy and that we are sort of assigned as the keepers of our family's records, that men rarely do that, that women would have their names put on headstones before they passed away, and a second wife would document the first wife, and that men don't really play an active role in that. So that's how it, it was a part of the show originally, and each square represents a different person, each person is represented by their nipples. It's not a sexual piece because it's almost more than 50% men. But I did have a really interesting side social uh, experience about that men did not want to let me cast their nipples. <laughs> and women just offered them up. <laughs> and I'm like, well, okay, what is that about? And uh, so what it is is that men are not used to being objectified. They're not used to handing over their nipples or showing them to you. And so therefore, they didn't want to do it. But uh, I coaxed quite a few of them into it, including Carl's in there. <laughs> so anyway, um, it was, it, it's really strange because referring back to the site-specific work, um, it, it really is site-specific to this place. It's in a building called the Center of Bioethics and Humanities. And, the woman who curates that building, um, her mother is a quilter, and she is very interested in sort of cutting edge contemporary art. And so she was like, this is the piece for that building. And so it was really awesome. Is it on wire? Like, how did you string them up? Yeah, that's the other thing about it. It's, uh, I made up my mind I wanted to build a quilt entirely out of metal. Mm -hmm. And so it's on airplane. And then there's, uh, I think there's over, I think there's over 42 hours of grinding, at least that, in that work. And then the, the, some of the nibbles are tin, some of them are bronze, some of them are cast iron, and then some of the tin ones are treated differently with gold leaf, and, uh, you know, so every square is a little bit
then riveted into the back of the castings, and then so they're like they're pulled taut. So you have wires that hold the nipples in the squares, and then the squares are held together with the aircraft cable. But, I, I mean, I think in terms of asking me sort of how it is mounted, it, it also creates sort of a dialogue about this memory-based approach because it also references specimens, um, you know, visiting museums as a child and you open the drawer and you like you see all the seashells lined out or the bug collecting. And that, then I'm using, I'm, I'm referencing that specimen-like approach back to people to document the people in something that was intended to document people. Um, so it, it really, it's, my memory-based approach just seems to just keep going, like one memory layers on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. So um, after that, the work started getting really, really big because uh, actually I made that as part of a project even while I was in school. And it was like all my fellow students hated me because they were like, oh man, how are you going to top that? So <laughs> I, just, I really didn't worry about it too much. I just kept making me hard. But anyway, um, uh, so then the next thing is I was granted a, a, an installation at a civic center. It was called the Lakewood Civic Center. And I created a space that was called a space and time. I didn't bring a lot of images for it, but it was a room about this size, a little bit bigger. And it was a dissected reality, and this was the rural side. So it had a surreal rural side, and on the other side it had a surreal urban side. And you sat on a mid-century sofa, and you looked through a 16-foot window at the urban side. Mm -hmm. And then I cast objects that were in the urban side, like a pair of cast iron cowboy boots, a sweet potato that I put bronze roots in, I uh, cast the potato on iron, and then put bronze roots in it, like you know how potatoes sprout. Um, and then uh, I cast a pair of antelope horns, and those hung on the urban side, sort of that idea of capturing nature um, and hanging it in your living room. There were these little trees that looked like they were in a vitrine, um, and these little special boxes that the roots grew through the vitrine. Um, there was a towel rack where there was a photographic sculptural installation of clouds that hang on a towel rack that gives the illusion that, that we can sort of control whether how nice our day is by referencing that blue sky. So it was a, it was a big installation. The image in the installation was uh, my own and uh, I had my fine art printer help manipulate it for me because since it, what I wanted, I, I, I had to search quite a while for an image of place where there were actually no power lines, no lights, no buildings, no houses. It took me uh, almost six months to find that place. I actually was on the way to Iron Hive. On the yes, way to David Dells, yeah, like yeah. a fiber tone. And so finally I'm like, I stopped and I go, this is it, there's nothing here. <laughs> so <laughs> that my, uh, my, uh, my uh, fine art printer helped me actually stretch that image because the the aspect ratio of the image is only 9 by 12, and I needed it twice that size. But since there was actually nothing in it, we could stretch it. Like there were no houses or trees or anything that would get distorted. So. Um, okay, thank you. Talk to later. Yes. So um, this work is uh, called Entertain, and it is a site-specific installation that's 16 feet by 12 feet by 15 feet. And it sort of is what I was talking about, referencing uh, our ordinary everyday life. It's a 15-lane freeway um, covered up sort of with that cartoon-like quality, which is an image that I manipulated. And then it actually documents the disappearance of a group of people called letterheads, which are sign painters, essentially. and. Uh, um, how all of that's been replaced by digital advertising and graphic design and it, there's almost no people left that literally paint signs. And so this was a, a detail down inside of it, the spilled paint, um, all of the paint cans had the clouds painted on them like that. And actually I brought two of the paintbrushes for the small workshop. And tell them what happened opening night. Oh yeah, that so then, uh, I, that's the other thing is with the memory based work, I've just decided that the performance, performance actually strengthens my connection to my work. 
And I sometimes just orchestrate the performance. Uh, I actually wasn't in this, so um, there's there were three live people. That's Carl. Joe helps me a lot of times as well as an assistant. The other two figures are mannequins. And so they handed out Blue Sky at the opening. I had these buttons printed on it, and the meaning of Blue Sky in a commercial context is that it's of limited commercial value. <laughs> so that was what was printed on the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I use those colloquialisms to sort of power that memory-based support approach. The, the funniest thing, though, on opening night was this family came up with a little girl about four or five. And she'd seen this like two days before, and there were just two mannequins uh, there. The mannequins there. And, and then all of a sudden, there was three of us moving around, and she walks up to me and goes, you're not real. Oh. And it just threw her for a loop. I was like, I, I, was like, I am real. So, so yeah, I like the work to come alive. I think that's, you know, it adds a sort of whole different element to everything that you're doing. Um, so it, it was kind of an interesting commentary. I guess when she first saw the little girl, first saw it, she just sat there for 30 minutes looking at her parents' set. And then she was there, you know, for quite a while trying to tell us we were not real. <laughs> we weren't supposed to be moving. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I sometimes really am not that happy with the fact that my work aligns with this man's work, but I just can't help but escape it. And so I think uh, one thing about Heinholz is that his whole life in, embodied these dioramas. And it, uh, that there were always these social and cultural connections to his work, as well as sort of the deeper, deep, deeper personal memories. Because it's something that people don't talk about his work, that he had, one of his early installations was this mental institution, and in fact it is sort of a memory about him working as an orderly. That was one of his first jobs. And, you know, a lot of times at school or whatnot, they, in books, they don't really talk about that. Um, but there is no doubt that the scale of his work and the dioramas that I'm um, certainly influenced by the things that he's done and the, sort of the surreal reinterpretations of, of real life events like the beanery, everybody having clocks for heads. And so uh, I just thought I'd just include this because I think that importance of um, performance, that performative aspect, and I think someone else, it was in your talk, yeah, included the slide. Yeah. Because I think this particular performance relating to Sarah, just like I wanted to make the quilt entirely out of metal, I mean, this man is, lives life as metal, metal, and more metal. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. But in this particular aspect, he used this installation. He did the site specific site element using the horse harnesses relating to the space. and. Time, but he also actually got in there and poured lead against um, against the baseboards and used the baseboards as a, a, a mold, essentially, for an end product. So I think it's pretty relevant in terms of using experience and performance and metal casting for where we are. Um, and so that sort of is end product. Um, and this is something I sort of plan to do very similar. I harvested these forms for a temporary public installation um, from grass. And then I would like to do the reverse. I would like to re-harvest forms like that, which I, Alvin was talking about. He's interested in the paisley. I said, well, we should maybe do a, a collaboration. But actually pour hot metal into the subtractive forms that I removed from the earth. So I think it relates a little bit to using the baseboards as a form, but I just had to include Sarah because we're all here. So um, I think the biggest thing that sort of facilitates this memory-based approach, though, um, and having your memories attached to work, which we were talking about in terms of generating that power, is using substitution um, as that place where you create a level of familiarity. Um, and that iconic, uh, uh, from an iconographic point of view or from a memory-based point of view. And every time I cast something uh, by means of substitution, it seems like it's a compulsion to do it, and then that compulsion leads to placing that object in some sort of a, a environment. So, uh, 
And so this is just an example of some of the things I've done by substitution. I decided I'd put a picture of Donnie Kane's boundary. Carl might be up there in the top. He was running the front of that corner. So it's a pretty fun experience, a three-story uh, furn commercial furnace and place where you can pour some big work. But, um, you know, just strange things. I'm a gardener. I'm really interested in the food. And somehow my green beans wound up on a clothesline. <laughs> This, this work here is, I call it um, Valley Girl, because uh, the very first place I lived after I left home was out in the San Luis Valley, and we were just out there with antelopes, no running water or electricity. And uh, so it's sort of, there's, I'm actually, it's going to at some point include a rabbit as well. And then um, the Coke bottles was the first thing I cast it, interesting, you know, included that sign with the uh, code for the iconography and it not it has surprisingly uh, not surprisingly it was the first one of my first pieces to sell and actually it's in the, the heir to the Charles and Ray Eames estate collection so might be the first piece that goes into a big museum um, and then uh, this was an extension of that series with the nipples. These are actually my own nipples. My father was in the car business, and so therefore it sort of references that, and not from a bad point of view. I don't really have any bad memories about it. It's all good. But there's, um, there's an interactive element to it where there's these little pieces of paper that you can move around, and they have sort of different emotions, like cold, warm, childless, um, hungry. Uh, and there's the cowboy boots that were in a space and time, they're life size. Uh, and I call those cut from the wrong mold. I made the, the mold purposely with a seam here because I thought it sort of gave meaning to the way cowboys live their life. They sort of consider themselves cut from the mold, wrong mold. And um, then I, I showed you this image earlier, a full metal jacket, that's the title of that piece. References both my own memories of the Vietnam War. I didn't know anybody who was in active combat, but my father had just died, and so it references his service in both World War II and Korea, and that seems to be where the power comes from that, that the tears that I've seen people shed, they really connect to sort of whatever emotion that caused me to create that piece. Well, how did you choose the fan? Actually, it was sort of Dadaist in a way because uh, somebody dealt me two words, air and jacket. And so that's what came out of it. Which I think is sort of an interesting practice. You know? mm -hmm. That might be something good for you, sort of getting to the bottom of why you do things. You know, just narrow it down to two of the most simple things. You know, force that on yourself and then see what comes out. Yes. I'm sure just what you were saying is everyone reads into the fan what they read into it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I get all sorts yeah. of stuff, but you know, the, the emotion definitely attaches to that piece of metal. Um, I don't know what it is, but it, it, it had, there's so either that, that strength of that emotion attached to that work somehow. Um, but. It's been good because it's moved my, you know, moved my career as an artist right along, um, that particular piece. So um, this piece here is a little bit of a dialogue. It was originally called Entertaining, it led to the bigger piece, but it, uh, it discusses sort of that uh, difference between the way my mother and I entertain, because she's got that 1950s, what was the book, the guy that wrote the book about manners, um, or, oh, you know, where everything just had to be just so. And, you know, how, now how you say everybody's so casual, you know, wear t-shirts and nobody worries about anything. Uh, but so she'd have people over and everything just had to be just right. So I battle with that because when I invite people over, I always want things to be just right, but I know nobody really cares. And then, um, so that came out in that piece as well as sort of um, down below, there's a trefoil design, which uh, sort of documents that reference to religion. And, the battle with my um, parents being two different religions. But the head is um, Rice crispy like and Rian Karan, she always says that looks very Sodom and Gomorrah or whatever she, Delilah, something very. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and then uh, this piece is called A Stitch in Time. 
same thing, references Aidings, references a book that my dad gave me uh, from the 1930s, a Dick Tracy book, that's where I, the primary colors came from. And I stitched together 175 watches and they come out of that black hole. Clocks are going while I'm stitching the time, tick, 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 you can hear the clocks ticking. And then I'm working through some anger towards my mother's mother who was into the guilt, the Catholic, Catholicism guilt thing. So I, as you're stitching it, people sort of see my anger because I have to, I have to like pull thread through those holes. And they're, I've, I've heard, I don't talk to people when I'm doing it, and I hear people say, oh, she seems angry. I, I think I am. <laughs> I am, I'm working through it. So, um, and then this is called Pastor Prime, the mirror is broken to reference aging. Um, I guess the fish people tell me are um, a reference to religion as well, the bronze trout. So um, I, this is the first time I realized that some of my installations are autobiograph autobiographical, that they are self-portraits. So Carl was traveling a lot, the garlic I guess represents that I'm alone. The tomatoes, or the fertileness, or the sweet sweetness of being a woman from a sexual context. The fish and the creole from referencing my dad, my dad. The lamp as the feminine figure of myself. The broken mirror for the aging. So there it is. It was a snapshot of my life at that moment. And uh, I think a lot of the site specificity and developing memories is uh, this is a great book uh, in terms of theory. Read. It's got some good Lucy Lepard quotes in it as well. It's by um, Min Wan Kwan, One Place After Another, I would think, sort of a must have. And, um, you know, I think it was meaningful to me in terms of some of the, if, almost all the images that, that I included, the referencing artists are in that book. And um, these two images as well, in terms of that sort of documentary approach and where that plays a role. <coughs> memory and using memory as a memory-based approach. So, that's my story. <laughs> this is my upcoming show, it opens on Friday. It's called The Wash, Rinse, Repeat. So it's sort of a continuation of another solo show called The Woman's Work Is Never Done that the nipple quilt was in and uh, um, Carl helped me with it. He did some of the welding. So. It'll be both an installation and new individual work, not on pedestals. <laughs> and this here photographs from an installation that she had in Ireland. Oh yeah, that was in Ireland too. I took wallpaper there and I decided I was going to hang wallpaper in a bunch of different places. So that's actually not sheets or towels, it's wallpaper. And there's, so there's a whole series of images called wallpaper around the world. Yes, it's good practice hearing yourself talk. <laughs> <laughs>